is Gary Allen, um, this book documents the res results of the Evidence for Equality National Survey for the uh, So, largest and most comprehensive national survey of ethnic and religious minorities in Britain, undertaken during the pandemic, was produced by academic at the Centre on Dynamics and Ethnicity Co., led from the University of Manchester. Today, we're going to hear from Three of the people involved in this thing, Head, who was the lead of the Eagles, and uh, is a professor of St. Andrews, uh, James Nazareth, uh, professor of the University of Manchester, and David Kage, who is a senior uh, here at the University of Manchester. And we'll also have video presentations from Sandra Kerr, based directly with this community, and Tanvir Khaled, Director of National Development uh, Eagles. Uh, and we can start with Lisa, who I believe is in Seattle. Lisa. Can reveal inequalities that were previously hidden. 
And this is the case in the book, particularly for the Roma, traveller, and Jewish populations, for whom we have some unique data. Overall, this book tells us that we are immeasurably far in the UK from being a racially just society. Let's take a brief look at some of the findings that the book presents. Racism, first of all, one of the strengths of the Evans data set and this book. It tells us that one in six ethnic minorities have experienced racist physical assault. One in six physical assault. And this is even higher, half of some groups, particularly traveller, Jewish, and people who identify as black mother. What about COVID? Let's think about bereavement due to COVID, losing somebody close to you. Indian, Pakistani, black, Caribbean, and Bangladeshi people were more than four times as likely to lose somebody due to COVID-19 than a white British, um, someone from a white British group. Four times more likely to lose somebody close to you during the pandemic. If you're a black Caribbean, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, or Indian. There are some positives in this book though. If we think about belonging to local area, we see that with the exception of Roma, the majority of people across ethnic groups felt a strong belonging to their local area. And this is particularly the case for Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi populations. So, to conclude these remarks, this book is the culmination of an ambitious and innovative project. But it's, it's also the beginning of new debates. Debates about measurement. Debates about why we see inequalities and crucially what might be done about them. And those debates start now, today, and we invite you all to be involved. Thank you.
So we're also in a moment. So, so time of crisis reflects those three drivers uh, that were going on, two of which were revealing the long standing of the COVID um, pandemic and its impact on ethnic minority people and the Black Lives Matter <coughs> uh, movement, which, which revealed long standing inequalities faced by ethnic minority people in the UK and elsewhere. And the other was a very hostile political environment that was going on. At that time, um, uh, research agencies and public bodies were desperate for evidence on the extent of ethnic inequality uh, in, in uh, relation to the pandemic. Perhaps not more broadly, but certainly in relation uh, to the pandemic. And when they looked at the resources they had available to them to study those, and particularly to study those quantitatively, but I think also qualitatively, uh, they saw they had nothing. And so they came to code and to Bridget and asked us to do some work uh, to begin to uncover these ethnic uh, inequalities. And from that, we, uh, we uh, decided that do, doing a survey would be a very valuable thing to quantify uh, experiences. Maybe not as full depth that you get from uh, qualitative data and biographical data, but to quantify the variation of experience to document inequality from that point of view. And so we were in the scientific backing in terms of studies of uh, ethnologies, and particularly quantitative studies. And that scientific vacuum reflected a lack of investment in large data collection for ethnic people over a long period, particularly since the early 2000s. So ethnic minority samples have been included in some surveys as boosts, uh, but never with a specific focus on the lives of ethnic minority people. Uh, not since, in my view, not since the fourth national survey of ethnic minorities. And that meant that most of those surveys had very limited topic coverage. They had bits of people's lives rather than an allowance to connect the range of inequalities. Uh, that people face and the ways in which they responded to those inequalities. So we're in a context where there were no resources for doing this research. Uh, part of that is because of the practicalities of uh, doing uh, big service with the minority people. Uh, so the traditional approach, a traditional approach which I was fully invested in this my career, but I've more recently uh, come to think of it as a um, traditional conservative approach. The tra tra traditional approach is to knock on doors in a random way and ask people to take part in surveys, persuade them to take part in surveys, get good response rates, and then you can say you're representative of the population. If you want to do that in terms of the minority people, then you have to think about how you do that efficiently without knocking on hundreds and hundreds of doors to get a handful of people. And so the way survey methodologists do this is to screen households to see whether there's an ethnic minority person in them, and often to do that directly by asking neighbours whether there's an ethnic minority person in them adjacent to households. And if there is something going on that, we'll try and persuade that person to take part. And they do that by sampling areas where ethnic minority people live, so highly concentrated ethnic minority areas. And this is a very cost effective way, even though expensive, of uh, doing the sample. But what it does is it excludes a whole range of people uh, from studies. So you concentrate on the largest ethnic minority groups, and you concentrate on the largest ethnic minority groups in the areas where most of them live. So where people live in less concentrated areas, in rural areas, in richer areas, and those groups that Lisa was mentioning uh, uh, who had never been in service. Uh, so we set out to do something about that. We also set out to deal with the fact that we were in the middle of COVID, and so we couldn't knock on doors anyway. Uh, and so we took a very limited approach to try to, to solve this problem. And that was to basically use a, what we described as a responsive sample design, which basically said, this is the ethnic composition of, uh, uh, of the UK. We want to have people who represent each of these groups in this ethnic composition. But we also don't want to exclude people. So if other people say uh, they don't quite fit into these groups, but they are identified as ethnic minority people, we want to include them as well. Uh, but to do that, we have to invite people to take part, uh, and we have to set quotas around how many people we have in each group. Uh, and we did this to a varying degree of success. But what we did basically was online. Uh, and through media advertising our survey and ask people to take part, monitor who was taking part uh, uh, through an internet survey, uh, and if necessary, uh, adjust our attempts to sample people. We did that particularly in relation to Gypsy, Roma, and Travelers, where we were under uh, recruiting and did some innovative things to And then we used statistical adjustments, so we know that these are representative, because these are people who volunteer to take part in the survey. Uh, so rather than getting a random sample, but then by looking at the characteristics of the people who we interviewed, we could 
made statistical adjustments to make them more representative of the, of the population. This is a real innovation uh, of a survey methodology, a survey statistician that we work with. Matthew Sherman has been innovating over the last, uh, uh, last few years. Uh, and as a result, we've got a sample that we believe is representative of a wide range of ethnic minority people uh, in, in the UK, uh, not just those that are typically surveyed. And most importantly, uh, surveying whose top, this topic focus covered the things that we and our partners thought were relevant to the lives of ethnic minority people rather than just being a generalist survey. So that meant doing a few things. But one was collecting data on things that people on the whole don't collect or don't collect very well. So collecting data on how people experience their identities, how they value their identities, how they conceive of themselves, how they describe themselves, and doing that beyond the kind of census categories that we uh, typically see. Uh, and doing it not just in terms of how people describe and value themselves, but also doing it in terms of what they do and how they live their lives. Uh, so that was quite innovative. Uh, and the other was to really innovate in terms of how we ask people about racism. Uh, and so to measure racism in a way that captured a range of domains in people's lives, but also captured their life courses. So rather than saying what happened to you in the last year, finding out what's happened to people in a range of dimensions of their life course, and, uh, over, uh, across a range of domains of their life courses, uh, their life courses. And then to do things around, given the time that we were doing uh, uh, this survey, uh, things around politics, political movement, uh, and protests. So collecting information on what people value in terms of politics, whether they support it by uh, and how they engage in political uh, protests, and on policing, what was happening to people in terms of policing uh, during the pandemic. Uh, frame this as inequality, but it's also about other dimensions of people's lives. It's really, uh, really important to them. And so what we also did when we collected other things, data on other things that traditionally come in surveys, was to shape the way we collect those data to reflect the diversity of lives of minority people in, in the UK context. And we did that in partnership with a range of organisations who both helped us recruit uh, people into the survey, but also helped us shape the, the content of the survey. I won't say very much about the findings because uh, Lisa's already, already done that. Uh, and who knows, they may want to, <laughs> to say something about that as well. But, but I, I, I think I, I'll, I'll just raise a couple of things that um, uh, Lisa hasn't yet. Uh, and, and one is about ethnic identity and the ways in which Britishness and minority identities are compatible. They're not compatible with each other despite the political discourse uh, that we have. So people are quite happy to say they're British, are quite happy to say they're Pakistan. Uh, they are not compatible with identities. Uh, we've heard about racism uh, and the depth of experience of racism uh, that minority people have in the UK. Uh, which is important counter evidence to the dominant narratives that we have from uh, politicians uh, in, in the country. Um, experience, adverse experiences of policing, policing during the pandemic. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, this was particularly evident for Chinese people, uh, but also for gypsy, uh, Roma Catholic uh, populations. And widespread support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, very across ethnic groups, of course, but widespread support for that movement, including amongst the white British population. Being is delighted to partner with then support the distribution of the event survey and facilitate the participation of Scotland's diverse ethnic and religious minority communities across Scotland. Often there is an assumption that Scotland is less diverse than England. In reality, our diversity is just different. Migration histories and long-standing domestic minorities such as Scottish Gypsy tribal communities indicate that the minority ethnic population of Scotland is around 15%. In larger urban areas, it is 20% plus. These figures reflect communities protected under the racial human rights provisions of colour, nationality, ethnic or national origin and includes multi-generational minorities and newer arrivals. Thus, it was crucial that in the context of pandemic outcomes, we were able to shine a light onto the specific nature of the economic, social and cultural impacts in Scotland, as well as contribute to the evidence of a national picture 
and lived experience of many ethnic minorities during the COVID-19 pandemic. We look forward to working with events, civic society organizations, and our communities to ensure that the comprehensive evidence we have generated helps inform policy and substantive changes for ethnic minority communities in the months and years ahead. What I wanted to talk about is how do we actually make it so successful? Like how do we make sure that we've got so many people to take part? So this is the largest survey of the minority people in Britain. We managed to get over 14,000 people to take part in this survey. That's bigger than a lot of the, uh, the national surveys that we have in this country. Um, and one of the reasons why I think we managed to make it work is because we identified specific partners that we wanted to work with that would give our survey credibility uh, and who would kind of buy into the survey as something that would be useful for them and spread the word about it with the people that they work with. So you heard from Tan Tanvir from BBC Scotland and hopefully we'll hear from Santa Kerr from Business Interference as well. As well as those two organisations, we partnered with 13 organisations in total, including people like Operation Blackpool, Rugby Trust, Race Quality Foundation, the NHS Race and Health Observatory. And we spent a lot of time in meetings talking to them about what we hope to do with this survey and convincing them to come on board with it so that we could then get them to do sound bites, advertise on their social media, do sound bites for media, things like it. The Voice magazine, we've got lots of things. So I think this was really important. But we didn't want to just ask them to advertise our survey. What we actually did is when we were building the content of the survey, it's all the things that James was talking about, asking about racism, asking about the type of dwelling people that they asking about their experiences, we actually wanted to make sure that we were getting the questions right. So all of our partners had the opportunity to comment on the content. Um, especially from uh, our past friends, families and travellers who work with gypsy and rural communities, they actually think it was very, really important to have some of the questions about housing should be uh, framed, what additional questions needed to be in there. So they were invaluable at that stage of questionnaire design, content, and then they were also invaluable in giving our survey credibility with ethnic and religious minority people who may sometimes have otherwise thought, well, this is just another survey, why should we take um, so I think the, their role in making this survey successful is not small, and uh, I just wanted to highlight that. The other thing I wanted to say is kind of looking towards the future. Uh, we've done this survey, and so what? So we have got um, a programme of work called Evens in Action, which is hoping to work with some of the partners that I've talked about, with some of the partners that I've talked about, so that they can use these data for questions that they want to answer in the areas that they are working in, um, which will have some impact and hopefully some benefit for the people that they work with. So when these dates are released, uh, they will be released quite soon for people to use, the general public, our partners. We're hoping to work with them, so the research team, EMS team, to help them use the data for public benefit. Just going one step further than that as well, we're also hoping in conjunction with the UK data service to make this into a teaching data set. So this means making a, a smaller version of the data set, not as many variables, because you know it's a bit overwhelming when you've got a data set with one thousand variables in it. So that our undergrad
And so that helps a little bit. It helps avoid misinterpretation, misuse of what we say. Uh, but actually, Yeah, uh, thanks. I'm Adrian Fidel. I'm Natalie Leeds. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, um, yeah, well, welcome the, the idea that the, there's a sort of uh, um, quantitative sophistication you know, needed going, going beyond existing census categories. I wonder to what extent you also reflect upon what you're trying to do with opening up census categories in terms of defining race and ethnicity. Um, because you know, thinking comparatively, ethnicity in the UK tends to work as a euphemism for all kinds of different characteristics, racial, religious, cultural, um, other, other visual um, markers. Um, you know, it's rather broad, it's a broad euphemism, it's, very difficult to see as a fully, you know, fully autonomous kind of conceptual concept. We really a lot of emphasis on ethnicity here, um, and you know, to what extent you, you, you are engaging. This, I think follows up from the previous question in some sense, to, with a with a sort of you know, helping helping us understand different forms of discrimination that that apply to different sorts of categories um, within within ethnicity as, as such. Um, Yeah, thanks for the question. Well, it is interesting because um, the concept of ethnicity is not without many problems, uh, which we realise. And one of the ways in which, we, as you said, that we try to think about that and address it in some way is to add categories to the census 2021 existing categories to think about groups that don't really get counted, don't really get spotlighted or highlighted as experiencing inequalities. Um, and, and try to make sure that we did 
small Bibles and Bibles, so for example, for Jewish people. Um, but I do think that you can't, well, we're not in quantitative work, I don't think you can start to say, well, I'm actually just going to use a whole different concept of ethnicity, and I'm just going to create these whole new categories. Because then how do we compare our data with other data sets that are already out there, whether it's administrative data, uh, data collected in statutory agencies, or data collected in surveys. So you have to work to some extent with the language of ethnicity and categories that are already there so people actually know what you're talking about. Um, so I think that's that's one thing that we're kind of constrained by. Well the other thing to add is as James was, uh, was talking about, we did actually get people to write in what their ethnic identity was as well. We've done an analysis of that which is in the book to think about how much more complex people's ethnic identities are than compared to just a tick box. Because people don't think of themselves as that tick box or what the description of that tick box is. They think of themselves in lots of different ways, which might be about skin colour, it might be about parents' country of birth, it might be about their own country of birth, it might be about what language they speak, what religion they are. So that's what we try to address by giving people the opportunity of ticking a box, but also writing what their ethnic identity is. I think we're going to touch on the practical difficulties of moving away from census categories, not just in terms of uh, making comparisons, but also actually they do have some utility. People uh, do seem to accept them in some way or in other ways of describing themselves. And the term ethnic minority is one uh, that people uh, at least can understand or identify with in some way or another when they're feeling concerned, uh, which is why I guess much of our reporting actually does reflect the census printed. Use them for a lot of the tables, if not all of the tables, uh, in the survey with the other category of Jewish. Uh, um, but um, uh, I, I think there's also the kind of way we orientate ourselves for the data, which is crucially important, uh, which I said earlier, you know, that this, this is about an anti racist agenda. So, although I can't remember the terms we used in time, whether we used terms in time consistently across the book, we probably used the term ethnic minority really uh, most consistently across the book. But conceptually, I think we're thinking about these as racialized minority groups. So it's the way in which people are racialized um, uh, that becomes the focus of our investigation. And also, importantly, in terms of the ominous categories, is this possibility for people to identify themselves as any minority, even if they don't identify with one of those categories, and to take one in the survey. So we weren't, we, we, we weren't excluding people from the survey, even if they didn't. Census categories that we've been using. Um, any other questions? I think it's uh, a Did you get that? No. Um, well, thank you for thinking it's an incredible piece of work. Um, sorry. Good talk to you. Uh, it's a uh, yeah. yes, uh, incredible piece of work, and uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, congratulations to this point. We've done work in the, the data that we release, but I think it's been mentioned this is a beginning of uh, the journey and beyond. So I wonder from here, um, uh, what will there be in the time of your follows and recommendations that might be able to be taken to, to the government or elsewhere on how to change all the experiences for the future as my want to experience to make things better in time? The last one's still with that. That's a good point. I think when we were writing the book, Trying to speak to a lot of different audiences with it. 
So it's um, academic audiences who are interested in race and ethnicity and also people who service, um, thinking across disciplines. And also we want it to be available for the general public as well, so we don't really want to preach to them about what the recommendations should be. But I think you've raised a very good point about that we have kind of maybe missed a trick there and how we might, going forward, uh, with the some of the publicity we've got for the book and thinking about how it's been quite well received with the people we've talked about it with so far, maybe in conjunction with our partners, maybe putting out some more communications about what needs to happen next. So I think that's a really good point. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, moving back to Claire's question, I mean, I'm interested in, I mean, we talk about race and in this country, but most of you talk about it in kind of a stupid way. And actually, um, you know, it's, his moment says something about the market versus the kind of war. And this Dan Abbott episode was quite a good example, I think, of I think she particularly the, the original article was not particularly intelligent. Her response was not coherent. And in some ways it was offensive. Yeah. The response to that response was actually also peculiar because um, in their argument against Hierarchies of racism, they actually just disappeared into the Travis completely and cast it as an anti Semitic statement, but it was just a, a statement that was wrong about how racism operates. And so I'm just kind of interested in the degree, and that came from your fact, <laughs> it was your fact based work that kind of, um, obviously, I'm not saying it was responsible for the stupidity. This was the response to your fact based work. So I'm interested in the role you think facts do or don't play with these numbers, these statistics, and the conclusions do or don't play in our racial discourse. Because that episode seems to suggest the problem is in a lack of facts. <laughs> It was um, a desire to misunderstand, a willful to misunderstand. We worked together for too long, I think. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think those are the things that are really hard for us, uh, for, for us to have intention of. So, so I think the, the intention is really to produce evidence to correct misunderstanding and misrepresentations where we can. The credit report is an example of the way in which evidence was interpreted uh, for the credit report, it, I think is a good example. Um, so you can read the detail of the credit report and miss the interpretations that are being offered on that detail. You can see lots of evidence of credit inequality uh, within the UK, even though um, the, the, the equality or the successes are promoted in the narrative much more strongly than the inequality. And racism as, a, as an explanation as an explanation is uh, wiped out. But it's still considerably considerable uh, evidence of the equality in that report. Um, but what I think what we've done here, and, and this is about the particular agenda of, of, of the research, is to actually reframe what the research is for. Um, maybe this will have an impact in academic settings, so it's in the academic settings as well as our innovative methods. So, so this research is for some mutual description of the experiences of uh, different people which can then be interpreted in a range of ways. Of course it can be, but, but we're really talking about people's experiences of racism and how that's impacted on the range of their dimensions of their lives. Uh, and then putting that in the context of contemporary narratives, it's very hard for a credit equivalent to then say that ethnic minority people don't experience racism. Uh, they can, um, I, I think, continue to say, so there is politics in this, of course, they can continue to say that there is anti Semitism in this society, they are happy with that narrative, and we have evidence to show that that is really important. But they can't say black people, Asian people, Chinese people, etc., do not experience racism. We show that very clearly, and we show that very clearly not just in terms of what people say to you, but also in terms of the discrimination experienced in various domains uh, of your life. 
So I think that, that, that I hope, helps us correct some of that, or helps us resist some of the misuse of, uh, of the data. Uh, and I, I think, I think that the issue with Diane, Diane Abbott, as I think you might carry, is that this was a really poor uh, piece of commentary that she wrote. It was wrong, she did make bad mistakes, she did apologise for those, but it was used in a very particular way uh, against her to fit her political movement's narrative about trying to cleanse herself of anti Semitism. But I'm not being too generous, he, he being too generous. So I'll just have a, a little something about um, whether, even in the face of all these facts and evidence that we have, how can we still have? Essentially, stupid conversations about race. I think you can have lots of evidence about racism and people's experiences of racism and backed up with all the percentages, all the charts, all the graphs. But that does not speak to whether people actually understand what racism is and how it operates in the UK and in other countries. I think the data can't do that. So I think in this country, there are still lots of misconceptions about what racism actually is and how it has in this country detrimentally, detrimentally impacted on the lives of indigenous and indigenous people. Um, and it's not just about the denial of racism, that that's quite easy for people who want to do that, just say, actually, it doesn't exist. It's actually about people who think, well, yeah, maybe it does exist. But do they really understand how it operates on lots of different levels and how it operates, as Jane said, for different groups? So I think, I don't think they can guard against that. That guard against that, I think that needs a much bigger kind of learning and teaching Um, we've got time for one more question. Um, I was particularly interested <coughs> in the um, what you thought about the Gypsy Roman traveling people because that's a as a somewhat invisible, as somewhat invisible minority that seems to fare actually worse than most other minorities. Um, <clears throat> I wonder what there was in that that either surprised you or that you think might be employed in order to. And so, just to say that in this survey, this is the in a national survey, this is the largest number of gypsy and Irish travel and grown people, if you put them all together, that have been in the national survey. So, I think I'm only going to have it here. Is it 263? 251. 73 Roma. Okay, so 251. 251 gypsies, 73 Roma. Okay, so 324 altogether in that group. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so when I was looking at Understanding Society, which is a very large national survey that has lots of funding um, in this country, I was looking at wave three of that data back in maybe 2013, 2014. There was 10 gypsy and Irish travel people in that survey. Um, we couldn't do anything with that. Can't do any analysis. So, um, just must mention that Nisa and Harry really um, took the reins on this one to ensure that we did get enough people in this survey. And we did that by working with friends, families, and travellers, hiring people who worked in the organisation to go out with iPads um, to areas where gypsy and Irish travel people live and encourage them to fill in the survey to help them with it. And we would not have got that number of people. If we hadn't done that. So, we actually can say something useful about their experiences. So, for me, those experiences weren't that surprising because we know from census data, when we did census briefings back in 2013, 2014, gypsy and Irish travel people are least likely to be in the labour market, have very low levels of health. Um, but we did learn more than that within the EU survey, specifically, we've got some information there about Roma people as well. 
Whether that will be taken up is, again, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? As it is with a lot of the data that we've got here. Um, I think the level of marginalisation and exclusion that they face within society because of uh, the way that they live in the types of uh, dwellings that they live in, the, the kind of racism that they face from statutory services, even when they do want to try to access them, I think is a very long way to go to see uh, some kind of improvement for a lot of the items that those women are facing. But James may have more to Not really, I think, yeah. The only thing is the, the, the Ethan's Matching study that you were talking about, and that you know, goes to what you were saying, Gary, is, is working in partnership with campaigning organisations to provide them with the kinds of analyses that they need to do their campaigning work. Um, and they're probably better positioned than us to judge what kind of what, what kind of material they will have on their campaigning work. They help us inform they help inform the concept that hopefully we can generate the uh, uh, the um, well, James, um, uh, Lisa, uh, all of you who worked on the evenings, uh, thank you. It's for as much as we um, may lament the state of uh, racial discourse and sometimes racial politics in this country, thanks to your work. What people can't say as well, you know, nobody knows them. We didn't know them. Well, you know, there's, there are facts. There are facts that people do have to contend with. There are arguments that people might make anyway, but then you can point to, thanks to your work, why and how they were wrong. And, um, and it's clearly a huge, a huge amount. Work, the French would call it travail uh, from you, the, the work of ants. Just, just meaning the huge amount of work that has to be done to kind of build something uh, uh, of that level. So that at the very least, we can now at least have something to refer to. Not that there was nothing before, but nothing is comprehensive, uh, uh, solid to refer to. Um, which has the capacity to shift the conversation and to change minds, even if those minds don't want to change. I want to thank you for your work, and thank you for your book, and thank you for the day. Uh, there is wine and what looks to be like beer at the end of an impressive amount of cakes still to be eaten. So um, please uh, fill your boots. Thank you.